I'm just going to start off reading the passage that we're going to be looking at this morning. Uh, Matthew chapter 6 is where we're going to be, verses 25 through 34. Uh, so I'm going to read this passage, uh, and then we'll spend some time uh, looking at understanding what it means for us. The words of Jesus. Therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food, and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air, they neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? In which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his span of life? And why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his splendor was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown, in, thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore do not be anxious, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Therefore do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. Let's pray for our time again. Lord. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for the truth of your word. We thank you for the encouragement that we find in your word, the hope that we find in your word, the challenge that we find in your word. I pray that as we uh, spend this time this morning, that by your spirit, through your word, you would speak into our lives. Help us to understand. Help us to be transformed. Help us to be the people that you call us to be, to walk in faith, to not be anxious. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. So what do you worry about? What causes anxiety or anxiousness for you? Uh, I asked my son Austin this week. I said, Austin, is there anything that you're worrying about? right now. And he kind of thought about it for a minute. And he said, you know what? I'm worried that the Chiefs won't win the Super Bowl again next year. <laughs> like, all right, if only, if only all of the, our worries could be boiled down to something like that. But the passage that we're going to be looking at this morning, Jesus talks a lot about anxiety and worry. And when I look at this passage and when I read this passage, I, I see this particular passage really as the the heart of the Sermon on the Mount. Now, there are many verses in the Sermon on the Mount that you could identify kind of as key verses and major truths to get on. But I think this passage is really at the, the heart, the kind of the emotional center of this passage because it appeals to our identity, our fears, our worries, our concerns. It talks about our priorities. It reminds us of our value. And it also reminds us why anxiety or worry are really unnecessary for the believer in Jesus. Now, we are continuing uh, our series in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus' the sermon that's recorded in Matthew chapter 5 through 7. And as I've said before, this sermon is one that you could read out loud in less than 20 minutes. Uh, and Jesus did this with a, a crowd that gathered around him uh, along the shore of the Sea of Galilee, probably a setting kind of like this, where Jesus sat down with this crowd around him and gave this teaching. Uh, I've shown this picture a number of times. I got a different picture from kind of, if you were uh, out on the Sea of Galilee, you could look up on one of these mountains and you could imagine being out in a boat out there and all of you see this like crowd up on the hill going, oh, what's going on up there? Um, well, Jesus would be up there on that hillside teaching people. And that setting is actually going to come into play with this particular passage as well, and I'll talk about that uh, in a little bit. But Jesus starts off uh, this particular section of the sermon saying, Therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Now that first word, therefore, in Scripture, that's always a reference to whatever came right before then. And so you've got to look at the previous teaching, what we looked at a couple of weeks ago uh, when we were, we were in this passage, verses 19 through 24, Jesus is talking about and giving a warning and an encouragement about not storing up treasure on earth. 
And he gives this example that anything that we have on this earth, moth and rust could destroy them, thieves could break in and steal them. Uh, Jesus talks about storing up treasure in heaven. And he's basically saying, you know, don't collect, stack up too much material possessions, either out of your insecurity or to save only with the goal of spending it on yourself selfishly. He's saying build up treasure in heaven. Invest your time, talent, and treasure for eternity. Now, how do you do that? Well, I'm going to get back to that uh, a little bit later this morning. But the question Jesus poses within that passage is how do we use our earthly possessions for eternal purposes? How do we invest what is temporary so that it matters? And Jesus is going from that teaching and saying, therefore, and giving kind of an application of how to live that out, what to do or not do based on what he has been teaching. So Jesus is saying, your, your treasure should be eternal treasure. And he closes that passage saying, you can't serve God and wealth or material possessions. You can't serve God and possessions. And he is reminding them, earthly treasures are temporary. And so he says, therefore, I tell you, do not be anxious about your life. He says, do not be anxious. Now, that's a phrase that we're going to see over and over again in this passage. And that word for anxious, the Greek word is merimnao, which basically means don't set your thoughts, be overly concerned about or worry. It contains the idea of thoughts that are divided, which is kind of goes back to that idea where Jesus was saying you can't serve two masters. Your thoughts can't be divided over different things. And so Jesus is saying don't worry, feel anxiety or stress related to these things. Uh, one Bible scholar writes that this, this word denotes to have a distracting care. And he goes on and writes, anxiety harasses the soul. It causes weakness. It irritates. It ruffles our temper. It is a sign of mistrust and of failing obedience and distracts the mind from communion with God. You know, worry and anxiety can take our minds all kinds of different places that we don't need to go with our thoughts. And so Jesus, within this context, is speaking about the temporary worries or cares in this life compared to the value of eternal things. Now, in this teaching, Jesus is not saying, don't ever make plans for the future. He's not saying, don't be responsible for things that you need to be responsible for. And of course, we are called to be wise in how we manage things, scheduling things ahead, being responsible. But he's saying, don't have a fixation, an anxiety, a worry over things that you can't control, things that might not happen, things that are temporary and of little eternal value. And Jesus in this passage points out uh, how many of our things, as he teaches about do not be anxious, he points out how so much of the per source of our anxiety are things that are temporary. And he says, do not worry about your life. And there he's talking about your physical life. That word for life that he uses there is one that can refer to soul or spirit. It can also refer to our physical life. And within the context of what he's talking about, what we eat and drink uh, and wear, he's speaking about our physical life. And then just throwing in there the things about food and drink and our clothing. And he says, life is much more than those things. Life is much more than these temporary things, than the things that we possess or the things that we consume. And there's a similar teaching from Jesus in Luke uh, chapter 12, verse 15, where Jesus says that one's life does not consist in the abundance of their possessions. Your life is much more than what you have and what you possess. Now, our world operates very much on a materialistic mindset. Materialism, you think you hear that word materialism and you think, well, that's somebody that just wants to get a bunch of stuff. But materialism goes a lot deeper than that. Materialism as a way of approaching life says that this physical world is all there is. For the materialist, these are the things that count, the things that you possess and consume and can hold on to. And so materialism, again, is not just the pursuit of things. At its foundation, materialism is a way of seeing the world where there is no spiritual truth. There is no eternity. There is no God. We are here by accident, 
and this physical world is all there is. That's the, the foundation of the materialist philosophy. But most people would say that they don't really believe that, but a lot of people live that way. The mater to the materialist, everything is temporary. It's all there is, so live it up while you can. You may have seen the, the phrase, he who dies with the most toys wins. That's the materialist philosophy. But you really win nothing. And Jesus here is saying, why do you live? Why do you focus so much on things that are temporary? Your life is much more than that. There are eternal treasures. There is a God who is real. There are people around you who are created in his image. There is an eternity that matters. You aren't an accident, and this physical life isn't all there is. So why do you worry? Why do you get anxious over things that are temporary? And to go on, he uses some illustrations from nature. And this is where I think the setting of where Jesus is doing this teaching is important, that he's up on a hillside overlooking the Sea of Galilee, and they're surrounded by fields that probably have wildflowers growing in them. They're surrounded by birds of the air that are flying around that they can, people can probably see. So when Jesus gives these illustrations from nature, he's just not talking about them. He's probably pointing at the exact things that he's talking about. So Jesus goes on in this, these illustrations from nature. He says, look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his span of life? Now, in the Sermon on the Mount, 11 times before we get to this verse right here, Jesus has referred to God as our Father, or your heavenly Father, or your Father in heaven. 11 times he has already said that in the verses preceding that. But that's not how Jesus' audience was even used to thinking about God. But Jesus is reminding us over and over, you have a heavenly Father who knows your needs, who knows who we are, who cares about us. And he says again about the birds of the air, he says, your heavenly Father feeds them. You know, and the birds of the air collect berries, nuts, whatever they can find, or maybe the yummy worm that you can get here and there. Now, this is not an excuse for laziness. If you ever watch birds, they work. They move. Uh, the average bird will eat one quarter to one half of their body weight every day. I only do that on Thanksgiving. Now, we have seen every, the last couple of years, we've had a robin's nest outside our house. We had one on the side of our house last year. We have one right on the front of our house this year. Uh, and we've watched the, the, we've seen the eggs hatch and the little baby birds there and the mother and the father bird uh, going and collecting food. I studied this. I was curious. And robins are one of the species where both the male and female feed the young. And they don't just stand on the nest waiting for food to come to them. They go out and do stuff. Uh, and find food. But I've also noticed they didn't build a little barn next to their nest. There's not a little refrigerator right next to their nest where they could keep the stuff that they're storing. They go out and get what they need that day, and it is provided for them. They do their thing, and God provides what they need. They don't worry. They're not anxious about it, but they're about the business that they're to be about. And then Jesus goes on and says, why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field how they grow, they neither toil nor spin. And again, here I picture him pointing to fields of flowers that are around them. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. And so when you think about these lilies of the field, the flowers that Jesus is pointing to, uh, he mentions the grass of the field as well. And I think when Jesus mentions these flowers and the grass, I think there's a, a reference in here to Isaiah 40, verse 8, where it says, The grass withers and the flowers fade, but the word of our God stands forever. He's saying these, the beauty that you see in nature is still temporary. It's a blessing from God. It's an amazing part of God's creation to see. And he makes this compar comparison to King Solomon, saying even Solomon, with all he had, doesn't compare to the beauty that you see here. And just to give you a, a hint of what they're talking about, 
Second Chronicles 9 describes the kingdom of Solomon this way. Thus King Solomon excelled all the kings of the earth in riches and in wisdom. All the kings of the earth sought the presence of Solomon to hear his wisdom which God had put into his mind. Every one of them brought his present articles of silver and of gold, garments, myrrh, spices, horses, and mules, so much year by year. Solomon had the finest of everything. But Jesus says that pales in comparison with the flowers that God has created. More recently, some of you probably watched King Charles and his coronation, and there was kind of a famous picture that was put out of him sitting on his throne with like the big crown on his head and these big purple robes around him. Again, the same thing. He's got nothing on the colors and the designs of God's creation. And within what Jesus is saying here, about these illustrations from nature, he also makes the statement, are you of not much more value than them? He goes on, he says, but if if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore do not be anxious, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? And within this teaching is a reminder of our value. Because are you of not much more value than they? Now, going back to that materialist world value, if your perspective on the world is the worldview where everything is an accident of nature, our value isn't any different from the birds and the lilies of the field. In the materialist worldview, we're not of more value. But if we are created in God's image, We are also stewards over God's creation. And yes, God's creation does have value, but it's different from the eternal value of you and of me. And this value is ultimately shown in Jesus dying on the cross for our sins. Scripture says that we are bought with a price. We are ransomed by the blood of Jesus. Romans 5 says, but God demonstrates his love in this, While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. You are created in God's image for a relationship with God. You have eternal value. You were bought with a price, not gold or silver, but the precious blood of Jesus, who says you are of much more value. None of those things are truths that the the materialist believe. If you've never believed in Jesus, put your faith and trust in Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins, that's what you need to do today, to believe in the Jesus who loved you and gave himself for you, for you to be able to spend eternity with him. And I'm going I'm to do something a little bit different this morning, is I'm just going to give an opportunity right now. If you've never put your faith and trust in Christ before today, I'm, I'm going to give you an opportunity to do that. And if you have, if you're already a believer in Christ, just as I pray, thank God for the gift of salvation that you have in Him, that He cares for you, that He sees you of great value. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I do pray that if there's anyone here this morning or watching online that has never put their faith, their trust in you, that this morning they would do that, believing that Jesus died on the cross for their sins, that through his death, he paid a price that we cannot pay to offer us the gift of eternal life. And so, Father, again, I pray that if there is anyone here that has never put their faith and trust in you, that they would believe in Jesus this morning for his death on the cross in their place, and that by trusting in him, they can receive that gift of eternal life. We just lift this to you in Jesus' name. Amen. So Jesus here is reminding us of our value. And there's another question here. Do you treat other people that way? Do you treat other people as people who are of great value? Because it's important for us to remember that as we interact with others. This truth can be really encouraging for us to remember, oh, yes, God says that I have great value. But we also need to turn that outward and remember everyone around us has great value as well. 
And then Jesus goes on here and points out the uselessness of worry. He says, you can't add anything to our lives. Now, the passage here, the, the Greek that's in this term, uh, that's in this phrase, really it kind of reads, who by worrying can add a cubit to their height? Um, now, a cubit is like 18 inches, which, you know, if you want to play basketball and want to really worry about adding 18 inches to your height, but it's really kind of, a, there's kind of an idiom and a figure of speech going on there where basically Jesus is saying, you can't add anything to your life by worrying, whether it's height or whether it's extra days or extra years. In fact, worry will more likely shorten your life. Worry, stress, anxiety causes all sorts of health problems for people. And Jesus is saying that worry is unnecessary because God knows our needs. It is unworthy for a child of the Heavenly Father, and it's unfruitful. It doesn't accomplish anything valuable or worthwhile. And his encouragement within this passage is to replace anxiety with faith. He says, you of little faith. And worry and anxiety ultimately demonstrates a lack of trust in God. Like we've got to get it all figured out and then tell God how to solve all our problems. Uh, George Mueller says, the beginning of anxiety is the end of faith, and the beginning of true faith is the end of anxiety. And Spurgeon is quoted as saying, little faith is not a little fault. Having little faith is not a small fault. That's one of the, few, that's one of the things that Jesus frequently points out to people and is, is critical of people and will call attention to, saying, you of little faith. And he calls us to a greater faith in him. Now, if you look again in your Bibles, if you're looking at this, if you look at verse 25 and look at verse 31, they're almost exactly the same. They say things very, very similar. It's like Jesus says, therefore, do not worry about these things. And then he comes to the conclusion again, therefore, do not be anxious about these things, about what you will eat, what you will drink, or what you will wear. Now, in the day of Jesus, wealth could be measured and frequently was by your crops, your land, even your clothing that could get passed down over and over again. People would measure their wealth in the amount of wine that they had. For others that weren't wealthy, daily bread, concern for food, for water, for clothing, those things were much more of an everyday pursuit than they are for most of us. But Jesus here is, again, within the context of what he's doing, is providing a contrast to the temporary things of life, the temporary treasures that people can seek after. And Jesus is saying those are not the things to value or be anxious about. But you might be sitting there thinking, well, I worry about different things. I'm worrying about paying my bills, stress at my job, health concerns, things going on with my family. Aren't those bigger than food and drink and clothes? What about my worries or anxiety or concern over those things? Well, when you look at the full teaching of Scripture, there is a lot that is said about worry and anxiety. God is concerned about all the things in our lives that can cause anxiety or worry. In Luke chapter 21, Jesus is giving some teaching and encouragement and reminders about the, the end days, the end times that are coming. And Jesus says, be careful or your hearts will be weighed down with carousing, drunkenness, and the anxieties of life and that day will close on you suddenly. Jesus is just warning, don't get weighed down with anxieties, worries, concerns of this life. Psalm 127.2 said, It is in vain that you rise up early and go late to rest, eating the bread of anxious toil. So much of our time can just be anxiously pursuing other things. And then the passage in Philippians chapter 4, this is a well-known passage that speaks about anxiety and a solution to our anxiety and our worry. Philippians 4, 6, and 7, the Apostle Paul, through the, the Spirit, writes this, do not be anxious about anything. Now, the last I heard, anything includes anything. It's not just about food, clothing, uh, those things that Jesus has talked about. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. 
And that do not be anxious is the exact same Greek phrasing that Jesus uses when he's saying do not be anxious. Bring your prayers, concerns, anxiety about anything to Jesus. 1 Peter 5, 7, casting all your anxieties, again, same term, on God because he cares for you. Casting all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. You know, much of our worry, our anxiety, is over things that will never happen, over things that happened in the past that we can't do anything about, the criticisms or the opinions of others, our health, our finances. Sometimes there are real problems that we've got to face, and we need to do something about them. Now, I've heard multiple people talk about keeping either a worry list or a worry jar, or a worry box. And whatever you want to do, it's something like something like this. If there is something that you are worrying about, have anxiety about, or concerned about, write it down. Index card, piece of paper, journal, whatever it is. Whenever that thing comes to mind, start praying about it. Don't let it be something that creates anxiety or worry. Turn those anxious thoughts into prayers and leave them there with God. That's the idea of cast all your anxieties on him, is throwing something out there without any intent of getting it back. So turn those worries, those concerns into prayers. And if there's something you can do about it, do that as well. There's always action. Doing something about a concern is better than worrying about a concern. And if you can't do something about it, that's when you cast that care to God and stop worrying about it. Ecclesiastes 11.10 says, So then banish anxiety from your heart. Cast off the troubles of your body, for youth and vigor are meaningless. Uh, And this word for anxiety that's here in the Hebrew sometimes is translated vexation. And that's not a word we use very often. Boy, I'm really feeling vexated today. Um, But this idea of vexation is the state of being annoyed or frustrated or worried. It's kind of a bigger term than anxiety or worry, but it certainly includes those. Then Psalm 94, 19, when the cares of my heart are many, your consolations cheer my soul. Again, we can have many anxieties that start to weigh us down, but when we bring those to God, God wants to replace our anxiety with his comfort, with his peace. And Jesus goes on in this passage, says, therefore, do not be anxious saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious about itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. And Jesus, as he closes this teaching, is reminding us, don't value the wrong things. Don't value the wrong things. He says the Gentiles seek after these things. And when he's talking about Gentiles, he's not just specifically meaning non-Jewish people. Uh, When Jesus uses that phrase Gentiles, he's talking about unbelieving people, people that don't follow or believe in or trust in the God of Israel. He's talking about kind of unbelieving pagans. And he says, those are the things that they seek after. Those are the things that they run after. So I did a little research this week on things that we eat and drink and wear. So this is just marketing money, the advertising dollars that are spent on these things. $656 million is spent in the United States on apparel marketing. That's just the marketing. That's not what we spent. $656 million is spent. $524 million is spent on advertising for soft drinks and water. The food service and beverage industry in the United States brings in over $800 billion a year. The global grocery market is $2.8 trillion. The worldwide spending on clothing is $1.7 trillion. Yes, food, clothing, what we drink, those are needs. Those are things that we, we need to have to survive and to be safe. But we get marketed towards getting even more of these things and told what we need to eat or drink or wear. And we're constantly being told, 
you need more of this and you need more of this and you need more of this. Yes, we need those things, but if your commitment to seeking after those things takes your priority, takes away your possibility for meaningful connection with others, your time in God's word, time in prayer, those are the things that you're seeking first. And that's what Jesus is warning us against. Because the command Jesus gives here is to seek first. Make your first priority some other things. And again, the seek first is, is seeking after pursuing. It's a present command. It's something to do and to continue doing. To seek first the kingdom of God. Now, Jesus over and over again in his teaching refers to the kingdom of God. And the kingdom of God is the rule and reign of God in our lives, in the world. And Jesus is saying, with your time, your talent, your treasure, invest towards these things that are eternal. Be in prayer about the kingdom of God. And here is a reference again back to the Lord's Prayer that we talked about a little while ago. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done. Jesus is here talking about seek that kingdom first. And he says, seek the righteousness of God. And the righteousness of God is a reference to the, the character of God. Righteousness is also the fruit of the Spirit. And Jesus is saying, investing in knowing God and his character and investing in having the righteousness that comes from God, your character counts more than your bank account. Don't treasure the things of the earth because those will end up becoming the things that you seek first. Jesus is talking about what we prioritize. So how do we do this? How do we seek the kingdom of God and his righteousness? Well, it's the same way that we store up treasures in heaven. It's shown in what you value, where you spend your time. Are you loving God? Are you loving others? Are you living generously? Are you building godly character? Are you walking in obedience and faithfulness to God? Are you speaking truth to others, sharing your faith when you have the opportunity? Are you living for God wherever you are and whatever you do? And I, again, I said this a couple weeks ago, this is not a call for everybody to leave their job and go into full-time ministry and missionary work. Your ministry and mission is where God has you right now. But you seek God's kingdom where you are, whether it's through your job, your hobbies, your activities, whatever you do, those are places for investing and seeking the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And when we spend time in God's word, that is a reminder to us of the eternal things and what is of eternal value. When we spend time in God's word, it helps us have the right perspective on how we see ourselves, God, and his kingdom. So spending time in God's word is investing in eternal things as well. And there are so many opportunities we have to spend time in God's word, but it is so easy to neglect that time. You know, I've got an app on my phone that it's real easy to just open it up and, and read some scripture that is there. But I'm also going to, this is just a total side note. I love using my Bible app and things like that. Don't totally give up using like a paper Bible because you can write notes in it and you can underline things and you can write. So even though I use that, I'll also just encourage you, still use a paper Bible to read every now and then because there's something really good about a physical, tangible thing um, that you can write on. But be spending time in God's Word. That reminds us of the things that are of eternal value. And then as we seek these things first, we have the promise from God that he will provide, that all these things will be added to you. He promises to meet our needs as we place our priorities in the right place, as we seek his kingdom and as we trust in him. And he says, don't worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Don't let anxiety about tomorrow take away the opportunities of today. And this teaching from Jesus isn't, don't worry, be happy. This is not hakuna matata, just forget about anything that we need to be concerned about. We are called to take care of our responsibilities, but make the most of every opportunity 
with each day. Make the most of your opportunities that you have this day to invest in the kingdom of God, to love God, to love your neighbor as yourself, to speak truth as you have opportunity, to invest your time, your treasures, your talents for the kingdom of God. Where is your trust? Where are your, what are your worries? Are you casting them to God? And I have a little homework assignment for you this week. Watch some birds. Stop somewhere and look at some flowers. There's no anxiety. There's no worry. There's no stress. Now, our worried and anxious thoughts can't be willed away or wished away. They need to be replaced by something. And that is where prayer and faith and seeking God's kingdom comes in, that you seek after these things instead of anxiety and worry. Continue investing in his kingdom. Don't worry for tomorrow. Do this day what God has for you. Seek him and his kingdom today. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for the truth of your word. We thank you for the beauty that is in your creation that reminds us of our need to not worry and be anxious. We thank you for the truth of your word. We thank you for your care for us, that you see us as of much more value. We thank you, Lord Jesus, that you went to the cross for each of us, paying the price for our sins, ransoming us, with the precious blood that you poured out on the cross. And Father, I pray as we leave here that we would be reminded each day to seek first your kingdom, to seek your righteousness, to put our worries and our anxieties uh, to you in prayer, that we would trust you to provide for the needs, the cares, the concerns that we have. We thank you that you love us, that you care for us, we ask that you would help us love you and to love others. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. So if you would stand, I'll send us out uh, with these words of, of blessing. May we go this week as people who store up treasure in heaven, who trust in our Heavenly Father, who walk in the love of our Savior, who trust in God to provide. May we love people with the value that God places on them. And may we seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Thanks for being with us today. Have a great week of serving our Lord.